Furry has a long and winding history, and the journey to this video has been a long time coming. Drama has long been a part of the fandom, as it is with every community. Whether it was the divide in the 90s, the media at the turn of the century, or the fur bashing that followed in the 2000s. While it has had impacts on the community, Furry managed to thrive despite it creating, in my opinion, one of the best communities out there. Unfortunately, over the last several years, the fandom has become an increasingly hostile environment for many different members. Furry is arguably in the roughest shape it has ever been in, comparable to the late 90s and early 2000s. There is a lot to talk about, and a better future to prepare for. Hello Furs from the web, my name is Scar, and this is the political war of the furry fandom. Stay tuned. <laughs> Before we begin to talk about incidents relating to the fandom, we have to look at the broader world. While furry is not an American exclusive thing, a large amount of the community is rooted here, especially when it comes to what some of us might consider mainstream fandom, as each nationality has its icons and popular furs. For instance, the Japanese, German, and American fandoms are definitely not in the same pool. There are many reasons for this, whether it be the language barrier or the geographical distance. I don't know of any other major drama that has occurred in other nations, and just about all the events I'm going to talk about appear to have originated from the United States. This decade has seen the U.S. change dramatically. The bipartisan election system has devolved into parties that want to do nothing but defame each other. I normally don't like having political discussions, and there's a good reason for that. Each side of the political spectrum seems to want to constantly yell at the other side's extreme counterpart. The right can shout at Antifa, and the left can shout at the Proud Boys. Some are denouncing Black Lives Matter as a terrorist organization, and others consider Trump to be the biggest danger to the country out there. I'm not picking sides here, as every case can be debated upon for hours. But there has been so much arguing that politics in and of themselves have become a toxic subject. My expanded family is quite large, and every year we used to all meet up and go to the family reunion around Christmas. It's been running for over 20 years, before I was born, and this year it is looking like it's never going to happen again. So much of my own family has head so far up the butt of politics they can't even stand to be in the same room as each other. The United States really hit this low in the years leading up to the 2016 election. Donald Trump announced that he was entering the next presidential race, and a lot of people didn't take him seriously. People backed him through the primary, as they did Hillary. Then Hillary was exposed with her emails and a lot of the left lost faith in her. Trump went office and the nation has kind of been at war politically since. Over the course of the last year, COVID-19 and the federal government's handling of it has only added fuel to the fire. This political charge has seeped into parts of the fandom. Furry has a bias towards the left and as such there have been more issues associated with radical liberals. There is also a level of bias against those who are further right. The number of political liberals also ties into the social side of the fandom, which is much more one-sided. I do want to point this out as it bears weight on the incidents I want to discuss. There have been issues on both sides of the spectrum. Despite what some people tell you, this is not a one-sided topic. Ironically enough, the furry fandom has had a major issue with misinformation. You can find a lot of people caught between arguments, often never understanding everything. Each side has two stories, and it's important to learn as much as you can. This is my first step any time I begin talking about a debate, and carries through the rest of this video. Some of these topics are controversial ones, some not so much. The same rules apply. Keep the comments civil, please. There have been numerous individuals who have received a ton of drama their way. Being a notable figure anywhere will garner some haters, but sometimes people get loud enough that a person can essentially become dethroned. I am not and never will be okay with cancel culture, as more often than not it creates a bandwagon effect. Sometimes evidence to support allegations becomes thrown to the wayside in favor of just punishment. Two Griffin is best known as a comedian, who got involved with the Phantom in the 90s. Over the course of his life, he's worked as a cop, performed as a musician, and performed as a comedian at dozens of conventions. He is for sure getting a history video next year, as there is quite a bit to talk about. Griffin has come under criticism in his past for his style of comedy, and a couple of remarks he has made. In 2017, Griffin received a ban from Anthrocon. The decision was carried out by the board of directors while not giving him an honest answer as to why. The official response was that his show was on the decline and they wanted to open up the stage for more popular acts despite the fact that the show constantly brought in more attendees than other performers, and the prior con had a cumulative 25 hours of empty floor space on the main stage, where he always performed. 
Tu speculates that it was because certain directors were on board with him being called a Nazi and just wanted him out of the convention. He refused to attend future Anthrocons because he didn't believe in the social climate the staff was breathing. Zosh was at one point one of the most popular furry artists in the fandom, and has a long history going back into the early 2000s. He's worked on the staff team at Furfinity, and founded his own furry image board known as Furplees. In early 2018, he was called out for allegations alluding to rape. He released a testimony and a bunch of chat logs to contest the testimony of ferality against him. Some argue that the logs give him more credibility. Others are quick to appoint at earlier stories of alleged into sexual misconduct. Zosh received a large amount of backlash from many people across the fandom. All things considered, he is still doing really well for himself with over 1,500 patrons. Kiro was a major furry YouTuber who was outed in 2018 for allegedly being part of a zoo sadist ring and possibly having sexual relations with his dog Koda who had passed away shortly prior. This controversy received constant back and forth between people on both sides of the fence, although there were significantly more people who believed he was guilty. With so much evidence and counter evidence, including people dedicated to dissecting every detail out of the entire situation, trying to find an unbiased look in the mess is a pretty tall order. Kiro quite literally had his YouTube career destroyed from his cancellation, and has mostly remained quiet now over the last two years while the investigation on him marches on. These three are some of the highest profile examples, although not the only to be subjugated to this level of drama. Most of these took place at the peak of the political hellscape in the fandom, in 2017-18. to The biggest issue behind these incidents is how they were handled. Whether or not you believe these people were innocent or guilty, the way parts of the community treated them result in large, drawn-out flame wars. Misinformation has been a key point, with people often going for the throw and forgetting to carry the reason why. You have to really dig through hate comments and one-note arguments to actually piece together what happens sometimes. Cancel culture took over these debates, leading to misinformation for the rest of the fandom. There were also incidents like Kiro where the people dishing out the evidence took it to Twitter instead of the police first. Furthermore, both sides of an argument might not be entirely in the clear either. Individuals were not the only ones targeted though, as entire groups were put under a heated microscope. Unlike the burned furs and associated groups, the antagonists this time around didn't feel the need to give themselves a name. The community surrounding them has done it for them. On the far right, we have what have been dubbed the alt furries, and on the far left, we have what have been dubbed the antifa furs. One of the most infamous groups to be caught in the middle was the furry raiders. The furry raiders are a coalition of all different kinds of furries who provide resources and an outlet for members. They began in 2007 and have become a sizable group. In the mid-2010s, ongoing criticism started over their iconography. People were claiming that they were Nazis because their logo shared a superficial resemblance to the swastika. There was also an image of their leader Foxler Nightfire waving which some furries believed resembled the Nazi salute. This got to the point where a local club Foxtrot banned wearing their armbands, and BLFC 2017 discouraged anyone from wearing the red variation. They have consistently been criticized over the years by members of the community and the broader media. In 2016, they booked a quarter of the hotel rooms for members at RMFC. Controversy broke out over this, and they lowered the number And after they discussed it over with the con. Some furries, especially over Twitter, threw a massive fit. In 2018, majority of the members were banned from Fur Affinity in the midst of a code of conduct update that stated, do not identify with or promote real hate or terrorist organizations and their ideologies. This has led to the belief that they were banned for this specific reason. It begs the question, were they a hate group? Some voices like Two Griffin have investigated themselves and disagree. Others like Dogpatch seem to say yes, citing a strand of incidents and even arrests of different staff members. Last year, the head of the Furry Raiders, Foxlow Nightfar, was apparently arrested for enticement of a child. Eventually, I moved on from looking at the drama surrounding the group as a whole, and looked at Foxler himself, but once I saw his wiki first- no! Oh my, a sexy Jesus in a hot tub. What the fuck? Yeah, there'll be a video eventually dissecting all of this. It could just be a lot of allegations that don't hold up under scrutiny, or there might be some actual weight and, you know, issues here. I'm not deep diving on him individually right now, as I quite frankly don't have the time, and this video isn't exclusively about him. The thing about the furry raiders, through all of the drama surrounding them, is that they were a collection of hundreds of different furries. There have been some actual problems among some of the higher-ups, but just about all of them have been branded with a negative reputation. Even their Telegram chat room, which currently has 150 members, is large enough that it is extremely unlikely that they all share the same beliefs. Calling them all Nazis or whatever is about as accurate as when non first call the entire fandom sexual, in my opinion. I can personally verify this because I actually got into their chat room on Telegram and have spent the last several days that I've been working on this video talking with them. 
When I first joined, it was pretty peaceful. A few hours later, some other people came on and the chat went way far south. After a few days, I can solidly say the group is as diverse as the rest of the fandom, just in a much smaller room. Furry used to be a place where you left politics at the door and people didn't go preaching or attacking others based on their beliefs. Alt furry as a definition is a complete mess. It is something that some of the far left has labeled Griffin, Cotherex, Genesius Wolf, Furry Raiders, and a whole lot more as. This includes anyone who is centric, right, or sometimes just doesn't agree with them. This among other insults such as being called a Nazi, racist, or homophobic. Sometimes people who have been targeted have genuine issues or made mistakes, but even the people who haven't have been subjugated to this. Simo of FurryDolphin.net has an article dating back to 2018 where he talks about this. He dubs the far left group of furries Antifa furs, and makes many comparisons back to the great internet furry flame war. These Antifa furs have done little to help the fandom and have been a big help in turning Twitter into what it is now. Haters and cancel culture have also flooded over the last several years. Furry Twitter is widely regarded to be one of the worst platforms in the fandom these days. So much drama starts and remains on this platform. I'm lucky enough to not have faced this reality yet, but if my channel keeps growing, it is going to be an inevitability. While these far left furs were calling such a wide variety of people alt furry, there were also a handful of people that identified with this title. And the thing is, some of these people do fit the established bill. But that doesn't mean everybody that's called an alt furry does. Fur Affinity received a lot of criticism for banning anyone who associated with alt furry or were even accused in some situations. Conventions have also been victims of or contributions to the fandom's political division as well. Some are just politically charged in one direction, and some have suffered because of the drama. Euroferns is the largest convention in Europe, and one of the largest cons in the world. It is a convention that I actually have a personal fascination with because of its history with furry music. Und du weißt Deutschland! Euroferns also sits an example of a convention that isn't afraid to keep a radical political side of the fandom out. It says directly in their con books, Code of Conduct, you are not allowed to wear, display, or otherwise propagate symbols of forbidden organizations according to the 86 and 86A of the German Penal Code, or symbols relating to the groups associated with the alt-furry movement. The alt-right called the far-right group out and pushed to keep them all away. When talking about actual alt-furries, this makes sense, as I mean, this is Germany. The law, as previously mentioned, already bans anything attached to banned organizations including Nazism. This is good as long as it's only targeting the real all furries and not just what the far left have been calling such. Rocky Mountain Furcon was a rather small convention held in Denver, Colorado, beginning in 2007. An artist and fursuiter known as Dio Toss Devil, or simply Dio, sent out a message on Twitter replying to a thread started by Art Decade. The thread started with Art Decade calling furry raiders Nazis, and Dio responded with the infamous, Can't wait to punch those Nazis. This went on with Olivia stating that it'd be more entertaining watching Dio get shot while attempting an assault. After a few more replies, Dreamer Hyena tried to shut this down. Dio would finish off asking if Olivia was threatening to bring a gun to the convention. Dio herself never intended to go to the con, but filed a report against Olivia. She was responded to by somebody claiming to be a RMFC legal representative, discussing a upcoming lawsuit against her that was very suspect and included names that denied any involvement. Dogpatch's article on this traces the author Kendall Emery as the original founder of the convention, further invalidating the letter. There is so much wrong with this incident, the entire thing started because Dio stated she couldn't wait to assault Nazis at a con she didn't even plan to attend, assumedly referencing the furry raiders who mostly originate from the same town as the convention. I wouldn't put it past Dio if this was just an edgy joke, but the responses of Olivia turned this thread into something more serious. While some different news outlets have cited different reasons for why RMFC would ultimately get cancelled, this drama could have had some contribution to the reported raised security costs. But this banter over the furry raiders and RMFC blew up with people using it as a lens to yell at others. Dio began with a threat or edgy joke against the furry raiders. Olivia made an indirect threat back at Dio and potentially other critics of the furry raiders and alt furry depending on how you look at it. Dogpatch had an article written by an anonymous member of the staff team that spun the story in such a way to help Dio look justified. The entire second part of this article runs as an ad hominem about the previous con chairman. And two Griffin presented his video making fair critiques to the article, but also redirected some of the heat from Olivia's extreme response back to Dio for making the first statement. The thing is, an indirect threat about shooting somebody is still more serious than a direct threat about punching somebody, no matter if they are independent or one is a response to the other. One can kill you, one won't. 
A lot of the external news sites also picked up making articles about furry having a Nazi problem and how it killed the Khan. The quality on such articles varies dramatically. Amidst the flame wars, the media coverage, and the cancelling of the Khan, very little came out of what was one of the biggest controversies in the last few years. Putting aside the talk about RMFC's other issues, this tweet thread became the most discussed topic, a tweet thread that started from a minor threat or an edgy joke that could have just been ignored. Political tensions have been growing in the fandom, especially with the witch hunt over the furry raiders. This was an outburst for many furries. What it demonstrates is just how political the fandom has gotten and how much it has divided us. One might ask why. Why has furry fandom come to this? What is even going on in the fandom anymore? As with everything in life, there is no easy answer. As mentioned in the first part of this video, the politically charged landscape of the United States has seeped its way into the fandom the way everything else does. Furries are diverse and so loosely affiliated to the point where anything that exists in the general public will find a presence in the fandom. Furries may be biased to the left, but that doesn't mean conservative furries don't exist. It's the same reason we have to deal with pedophiles, zoophiles, and worse. It's also the reason why we have artists, fursuit makers, musicians, YouTubers, historians, and more. Furries being as inclusive as they are is a major factor. This is not the issue though. The issue is how people who begin to search trouble are handled. The burn furs, despite burning for so long, were ultimately ignored or peacefully opposed by a lot of the fandom. The problem with the politics these days is that people constantly retaliate and add fuel to the fire anytime a spark is found. Twitter has become the poster child for furry flame wars and is slowly being abandoned by many members of the fandom. Those who aren't are using blocking features to keep those array of trolls, uncivil debaters, and politically charged individuals off their feed. This does present its own bunch of issues as well, like echo chambers, but again, that's not the point of this video. If a block list is formed of individuals that an extreme political furry deems as old furry or antifa furry, then it is very common for people to get grouped in and receive a bad reputation even if they weren't part of the other extreme. I personally advocate for Anthrodex, which so far has proven to be a safe alternative to Twitter, and if it ever takes off, there's a good chance I will transfer there completely. Some people believe a lot of this user base on Twitter migrated from Tumblr after its crackdown on subsequent death for many users. Tumblr used to be a rough spot for furries, and many avoided it. The good news is that furry is a very localized fandom. You can migrate to a different platform and find entirely new kinds of furries. There are other platforms than Twitter, each of which have better people on it. The underlying issue is that the fandom needs to stop engaging in flame wars and be able to respect people who might have different opinions or beliefs. Those who can't are the real problem and have been tearing this fandom apart for the last several years. Furries also need to stop when a controversy begins and take a step back before jumping on a bandwagon. This is the driving force behind cancel culture, and is the cause of so much drama in the community. Ever since the beginning of furry fandom, it has been defined by two different things. The growing fascination with anthropomorphism as an art form, and the freedom and inclusivity the original furries founded when they broke away from comic book and sci-fi fandoms. Through all the ridicule from other communities, the media, Hollywood, and dedicated antifurs, the majority of furry remained a place where you wouldn't be judged. In my burn for video, I said that on a foundational level, I agreed with them on needing to draw a line. I think I now have a more revised answer. In my opinion, not only do we need to take a stance against furries who do things to harm others, we also need to ignore people who try to attack others because of beliefs or create bandwagons. At the same time, when an issue crops up, furries need to be civil and open to both sides of the argument. It's time for the fandom to mature and grow up again. After talking about this, it might be hard to believe that there is a large side of the fandom where most of this doesn't occur. As previously stated, furry is very localized to each platform and almost all of the discussed events have been focused significantly on Twitter. And while the number of controversies has been a little high, not all of the mainstream furry fandom has been involved. Even those who have been aren't all main problems. At the end of the day, I still respect many articles Dogpatch puts out. I still follow 2 Griffin and find him hilarious. I still appreciate the Anthrocon board of directors for all the work they do running the con. And I still don't brand anyone who associates with the furry raiders some alt-right Nazi without giving them a chance. And I still love those close to me even if they do have different political views sometimes. You can still follow these big groups or individuals even if you disagree with them on certain things. Don't ever be afraid to express your opinion, even if it's unpopular, and even if some false furries will attack you for it. Furry can become a better place, without sacrificing its inclusive nature. We just need to learn to respect others' beliefs and in some cases outright drop controversial topics at the door. I very strictly keep politics off my Twitter, and whenever I get into discussions, I remain civil. 
I do this because I feel like it's a standard that should be set for other members of the fandom. Even though you shouldn't be afraid to have your own opinions, you need to ask yourself, is this really the place and time to talk about it? Does there really need to be a debate about this in this setting? Or can you just set it aside and celebrate anthropomorphic animals? To me, it does feel like the political fire has died down somewhat over the last two years, even if not completely. There are contentious topics and arguments, but they aren't nearly at the level they were back in 2018. Then again, I don't always keep up to date with everything going on in the fandom. One of the most heartwarming things I've seen recently is watching some conventions carry on digitally, and people who spend a lot of time making virtual reality recreations. I have a habit of being really optimistic, but I do think furries could be phasing out of the political war in a little bit. My biggest fear is the upcoming presidential election that could start this whole cycle over again. Only time will tell where the fandom is going, but until then you can do your part to help build a better fandom for everyone. Thank you so much everyone who has joined me on this journey of cataloging each era of the fandom. The furry history series is just getting started, with so many individuals, events, and more with stories to tell. This is my last history video for the year though, as in just a few days I will be beginning production of my next Christmas animation for my other channel. Considering it will likely be several years before I make another timeline video, it will be interesting reflecting on this one when the time comes. If you want to stay updated on stuff, you can join my Discord, but other than that guys, until next time, stay tuned.